watching the video sermon podcast of First Baptist Church of Marble Falls, Texas. For almost 130 years, FBCMF has served Marble Falls and the Greater Highland Lakes area faithfully through children's programs, youth activities, and adult discipleship. We invite you to join us each and every Sunday morning at 9 and 10.30 a.m. for deep fellowship, rich worship, and a spirit-filled message. For those who find themselves unable to attend on a Sunday morning, we stream those services. Simply visit fbcmf.live during either of our service times to view it. Never miss an archived sermon by subscribing to this podcast on YouTube by visiting youtube.com forward slash fbcmftube. And to learn more about our church or to listen to an audio-only version of this and other sermons, please visit us online at fbcmf.org. As Christians, we have these life-giving beliefs. Uh, uh, We have beliefs about God, and we have beliefs about um, ourselves, and we have beliefs about humanity and our world, and those beliefs make rational sense, even though popular atheism claims that our beliefs have zero rational credibility. And so in our sermon series that that we call Evidence for Faith, we're looking at some of our reasons for believing, and and I hope that you are encouraged in your faith today so that you can know that that you have reasons and, and, and rational reasons for believing what you do. And as I preach on this, I want you all to know I'm not trying. It's going to be, as we talk about the reasons for Christianity, I'm not trying to preach over anyone's head, and I'm not trying to give any kind of seminary class on any of this. My purpose is very simple, and it is to give hope by showing that the beliefs that that you and I have as Christians in Jesus Christ are indeed beautifully reasonable despite what our world has to say about it and despite what popular atheism often says. And perhaps there is somebody here today, maybe you're um, a young person in, in youth or, or a college student or in your 20s or 30s, maybe there is somebody here and for a long time you've been on the fence about Jesus Christ. And you've been waiting for a long time for some Christians to give you a rational reason for why they believe what they believe. And, and, and if that is you, I pray that during this sermon and the sermons following and what we've already talked about, that slowly the Holy Spirit is beginning to help you to see that that our beliefs are not nonsense, that we do have reason and rational credibility for them. And if any of you are not right there, I bet you that all of you in here know of somebody who is on the fence in regard to who Jesus Christ is. You know that person. And so as I preach about all of this, will you just keep them in mind and be praying for them and and thinking about them that God will reveal um, his truths to them. And also remember this, that that even though we're creating an argument against popular atheism, um, we're aware that people today are hungrier for the word of God than we think they are. It is not us Um, against our world. It's us for our world. And that idea can get lost in sermons kind of like this. And so for the past two weeks, we have talked about evidence for our Bible. And this morning we're going to shift and we're going to talk about something very different. Today we are addressing some of the accusations against Christians that any belief in a, in a deity, such as the one that we have about God, is not rational. Atheism says that there is no God and that it is not logical or rational for any of us to sing what we just sang and to believe that there is a God that we don't have, they will say, reason on our side. They claim that because Christians cannot prove prove that God exists empirically, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, because we cannot prove that he exists empirically, then there is no God, and we have nothing to base our our, our faith on. And they'll also say that humanity all over the world, that humanity is good, not sinful. All right, 
We're going to examine some of these things, but, but I want you to know that as I preach on this, that, that it is what Christians are supposed to do. A moment ago, Trey read the Scripture in Acts chapter 17, where the Apostle Paul met some people, and he, he reasoned with them. He talked about how um, logical Christianity was with them. The Apostle Paul was brilliant in this. If he's talking to a Jew who believes in the Old Testament, then he would bring out the Old Testament. But if he's, if he's talking to somebody who is in Athens and they're a philosopher and they don't believe in the Old Testament, then Paul is going to use a different kind of tactic to talk to them and to help them to under, understand that what we believe and what he believes about Jesus is really exciting and really good. And so in, in Acts 17, Paul talks about it, and we have it here on the screen for you to, to see here how he does this. He sa it says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, and Athens is the hotbed of philosophy in the ancient Roman world, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols, and so he what? Reasoned. He's using his mind and reasoning in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as reasoning in the marketplace day by day with the people who happen to be there. Man, he's arguing for Christ. And a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to, to what? Debate. Debate with the Apostle Paul. And so the, these words, I want you to notice the words reasoned, and debate. Paul is, is giving everything he can to show that the story of Jesus Christ is rational. And so he debates. He, he believes that it's reasonable, and he debates them philosophically about these worldviews. Now, y'all, after the Apostle Paul came and left, many Christian leaders have picked up this mantle of trying to reason and talk to people about how rational Christianity really is. And, and the reason that they do this is that they, they're aware, and we need to be aware of this too, that there are people all throughout our world that are thoughtful and reflective, and they're interested in a rational conversation about God. And Paul knew this, and so have all these other Christians, and if people are thoughtful and reflective and they're interested, then they wanted to be ready to have a rational conversation with them about the Savior. In AD 50, there was a, a Christian leader named Justin Martyr, and he wrote a letter to the Roman emperor, Antonius Pius, and he also wrote letters to the Roman Senate. I mean, he, he went big trying to explain to them the reasons for believing in Jesus Christ. And he talked about how rational it is and how our worship is rational and how the Lord's Supper is rational and what all of these things mean. And he, he, he tried to persuade them through, through reason. And, and, and as he did it, he, at one point he starts to create a reason for why the Roman government should not persecute Christians any longer. And I want you to notice what Justin Martyr wrote and how he, he appeals to the mind to say, really think about this, emperor, and the reason for not persecuting Christians. Look at this. This is from A.D. 150, Justin Martyr. This was in his book called First Apology, and it says, he write, and to the emperor, if these things seem to you to be reasonable and true, and he had just explained a lot about Christianity, then honor them. He's saying, we're reasoning this out here. Honor these things if they seem reasonable, but if they seem to you non, like nonsense, well, then despise them as nonsense. But either way here, do not decree death against those who have done no wrong as you would against your enemies. He's saying, listen, Christianity, Christians are not your enemies, emperor. Don't declare death to us. We have broken no rules. Use your mind here. Why would you persecute Christians if we have done no wrong? It's reasonable. And he lays these out. In every period of time, there are just and martyr kinds of people that rise up in Christianity, and they try to lay out a reasonable defense for why we all believe what we do. The, the, these names will ring a bell to you. Some of them have given their whole life 
to doing what I'm talking about. Have any of you ever heard of the name Ravi Zacharias? How about the name Alistair McGrath? He's one of my very favorites. And he's just logical as he appeals to what is right and what makes sense about Jesus Christ. Um, Josh McDowell. Maybe some of you will remember the book, A Case for Christ, written by the, the journalist um, for the Chicago Tribune named Lee Strobel, who wrote A Case for Christ. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says, Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that you have. But when you do it, do it with gentleness and do it with respect. And so as we lay out our reasons for hope, we do so with, with great gentleness and respect. But at the same time, Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your conversation always be full of grace and seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everybody. I like that. If we're going to answer anybody about our faith, then we need to be good at it in such a way that it's seasoned with salt, meaning your answer about what Jesus Christ means to you cannot be bland. It cannot be boring. It has to taste like, like substance. I, I, when, I, when I think of something perfect and salty, I think of Doritos. <laughs> and I love them. And I, when I tell somebody about Jesus Christ, I want it to be like they're eating Doritos, and they say, my goodness, that's good. We season it with salt. We, we, when we talk to people about Jesus and we give reasons for it, it's not bland. It's not boring. It's something with, with substance as we talk about it. So I got an idea. Let's create reasons for believing in, in Christianity, and let's season it with a little salt this morning. Atheists claim that since we cannot prove that God exists empirically, then he doesn't exist. All right. The word empirical. I have it on the screen. The word empirical means things that can be known by experience through your five senses. Empirical knowledge comes when a scientist will examine a cell through a microscope, and, and as he experiences looking and studying that cell, he realizes that there are parts to the cell. And then he goes and he gets his friends, and he says, look, does your experience by looking at this say the same thing? And the empirical knowledge that comes out is that a cell has many, many parts. Now, y'all, we, we, we can get quite a bit of knowledge about how our world works and what is in our world through this idea called empirical knowledge or the empirical method by examining things. If somebody asked me, Ross, what is your Bible, what is your Bible made of? That is an, they're appealing to the empirical method for me to tell them that my Bible is probably mostly paper and, and, and some leather. And, and what the atheist might do is suggest that, well, if we cannot prove that God exists by putting him under the same kind of empirical method by looking at God through a microscope or a telescope and then see God with our actual senses in such a way that we can bring other people and say, wow, look at through the telescope. Don't you actually see God with your real eyes? And, and, and they say, yes, we can. And then we can replicate it over and over. Since we cannot do that about God then we cannot say that he is empirically proving to be true, then, then we can't say that he exists at all. Well, they're demanding from Christians this empirical proof in order for anybody to say that I'm certain, I'm certain that God exists. And when they put that on Christians, y'all, it's true. It's true that we can't give an empirical kind of proof about God. But I want y'all to know, don't let that bother you. Amen. Philosophy points out that this empirical method that they prize and say is the, the only way to see, to find any knowledge, philosophy tells us that that empirical method falls short in a lot of questions, not just the question about God. 
Empirical methods always fall short in answering the more, the more abstract questions about life, like um, what is the meaning of life? Can't look at a microscope or through a telescope and find the meaning of life. In fact, the empirical method cannot, cannot answer life's most important questions. The empirical method might be able to answer a lot of questions about how our world got here scientifically, but then when humanity asks, yes, 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 but, but what is the purpose of our world? Empirical method has nothing to offer and they are dead silent about that. And, and on top of that, remember this, um, the burden of proof does not fall on, on Christianity. The burden of proof always falls on, on atheists. And here is where they'll get in trouble. In the court of law, the burden of proof falls on the prosecutors to say that this person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, in, in the court of public opinion, um, atheistic prosecutors who want to prosecute Christians and say, you are guilty, Christians, because your belief is not reasonable, it's not rational, it's illogical, and it's superstitious. And then when the judge then asks the prosecutors, okay, you're, you're saying that their belief is irrational, where is your proof then that God does not exist? You're saying that theirs, when they say God does exist, is irrational and that they have no proof. Where is your proof? empirical proof that God doesn't exist. And they can't give any. They cannot give proof that God exists. They like to play the role of prosecutor, but they cannot disprove God. So if we're talking about being reasonable here, how, how unreasonable is it for people to demand of Christians that which they cannot produce themselves? They, they, will, they will never, never be able to disprove God in, in this um, kind of uh, 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 scientific way because our God doesn't work that way. He's different than that. And so when they say, well, prove God to us, and we say, well, we can't, you're asking us to use the empirical method, and, and, and that doesn't work for what we do and what we believe here. And they go, ah, ha, ha, we got you. And we go, no, 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 no. Well, let's reverse it. Can you disprove God by the same method that you're demanding of us? And they can't. So when, when popular atheism says, we don't believe there is a God, if they're not appealing to proof because they don't have it, what are they appealing to? Faith. Amen. They just believe it. They, they, they believe simply because they choose to believe that there is no God. It's faith. So y'all get this. The question is not that here is their perfect, rational, logical proof that God doesn't exist versus our unreasonable, um, biased, subjective faith. They like to say that it's their proof versus our faith. They love that, but, but it's, it's wrong. The real fact is this, is that it's not their proof versus our faith. It's that it's their faith versus our faith. It is the, their faith worldview versus our faith worldview. And, and so I, I want all of you youth here and, and young adults know this. Do not ever, ever be intimidated. If you go somewhere and, and you're talking to somebody and they make you feel as if they have all the rational proof on their side and that you have nothing. It's not true. They don't. And besides, on top of this, besides the fact that empirical knowledge always falls short in helping us to understand the most important questions in life, on top of that, Christianity does offer many answers to what we see and experience here in this world. And let me show you this now, like this. Popular atheism claims 
and promotes the belief that all humanity is good, not sinful. And, and so if, if you can just give a good person who is, who is intrinsically good a good environment to grow up in, then that person's going to be great. Now, a part of this is, is very true. I, I believe that, that we need to create the most nurturing, best environments for people in the world. But when, when somebody suggests that all people are good, that is a happy thought, I admit. But, but something doesn't compute right here. Many people in this world, when they hear this idea that all people are good, they want to believe it. But they just cannot square that idea with all of the horrible things that they see people do and all of the horrible things that they have done in their own life. It, 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 they, they want to believe it, but, but something just doesn't seem logical about it. Um, even people who come from great nurturing environments, what, what is rational then is to say that, that humanity may not be that good after all. That's reasonable. And here is an example. Um, many atheists claim that the greatest age of, of, of reason was the Enlightenment period that's actually called the Age of Reason from the 18th to the 19th centuries. And during this time, the Western civilization measured knowledge and measured truth by, by what can only be observed and, and through the scientific method. And humanity did do some really wonderful things during this age of enlightenment time. Um, in fact, the ideas of our country's democratic republic was born out of all of this. The Industrial Revolution came about. The Emancipation Proclamation. Isaac Newton's discoveries. And according to popular atheism, this movement was wonderful because it is the beginning, they say, of, of humanity moving past faith in God. And, and they, humanity is letting go of the evils of religion and getting better and better in their enlightenment and in their ability to understand more that they were good. Well, let's square that with history for a minute before they completely paint with such a broad, broad brush and say that all people are good and look how great we were during this enlightenment. Well, as they say that, do, do they not realize that it was the most enlightened, reasonable people in the whole world that created Nazism? The German people, they, they, they don't realize that, that Hitler's anti-Christian, anti-Christian stance, which is very, very well documented when he preached and said things like, there is no God except Germany. Well, we're... Well, what do you mean the most enlightened people achieved good things? It was the enlightened, a reasonable people who brought about many wars and a reasonable, enlightened people who tried to take over other countries, who created a huge slave trade, who, who, who brings imperialism and colonialism. And, and, and also, you know, if people are at their best without religion, then why wasn't the atheist Joseph Stalin a heck of a good person? <laughs> well, we can bring out when they say, well, humanity is good. I'm telling you, history gives fact after fact to say, look, hold the brakes here. Whenever people get power, power doesn't corrupt the people. Power reveals the corruptness in their heart. We can see it everywhere around us. Atheism's claim that, that people are good feels great to say, but it's not rational because of what we know about people. Any reasonable person quickly will point out that humanity has a problem. We don't know what it is, perhaps, they might say, but there's still a problem. And at our, at our best, we do wrong by other people. Well, and, and, and popular atheism doesn't even see that. And to this fact in humanity, Christianity comes with an idea. The Christian worldview has 
a solid response to this. Looking at humanity and seeing that humans have a problem, they say, sin. What if? What if sin is the problem and the ugliness of sin has corrupted everything that it touched? Our belief in a fallen humanity makes sense of what we see going on in our world. Without that, how do we make sense if they just say everybody is good? I I ask you, which one is more rational as you look at the world in history? Atheism pretends that it doesn't exist, but every time somebody gets hurt and their heart gets broken and life doesn't go well, there's something inside that says it's not true. There's a problem here. And so we say, well, sin, and then atheism then will say back to me, okay, Ross, you you say that sin is a problem of our world? Then how is it, how do people do all of the good that, that we see in our world? Do you not believe that people are doing good? And so, fair question. And we answer, sure, we believe in the goodness of people. Absolutely. I am not denying and nor Does the holy word of God deny that that people do good? In fact, as we look at humanity, it's, it's Christianity who has a balanced perspective. We say that people do good. Now, I'll tell you why. We we say that people do good because we are part of the um uh that that we have the image of God imprinted upon us and that we've been touched by the Lord, and He's touching our world and moving it as well. Through, through God, we have done a lot of good. And so we don't deny the goodness of humanity in that sense. Humanity across the whole globe might be better off right now than, than we have been. There is less violence globally, less racism globally, l- more civil rights and respect than before. Slavery has almost been abolished throughout the entire world. And in more countries than ever before, people have a right to vote. There is access to education and life-changing information for people than ever before. Women, women are treated better globally than they ever have been before. And so when atheism brings up all of those things, I'll say, you know what, I agree with all of that, and I'll even add to it. I know that humanity has done great things. People have done good. Christianity doesn't deny that. In fact, we offer a rational reason for it. We believe that we're made in the image of God, and that gives all of us the capacity to do good. Humankind exemplifies two things, both a capacity for great good and a capacity for great evil. And in, in, in these two things that we see everywhere around us, The goodness and the evil are are both balanced in Christianity. We deal with it. And so Christianity offers a balanced, reasonable response to what we see in the world around us. Atheism are the ones who have an imbalanced view in this. So Christianity gives us a critical lens to explore the, the complex motivations and the mixed agendas that we see in humanity where at one moment we are amazing and selfless and then we just turn around and lose it all. Our, our balanced view has merit, y'all. It's reasonable. And when Christianity gives both of these balanced views, I want all of y'all to know that that is evidence that gives reasons for what we believe. Isn't that exciting? Amen. It's, it's reasonable. So, If popular atheism is is reduced to a a belief that God does not exist simply based on faith, because we said that they have no empirical evidence to prove that God doesn't exist, it's a faith for them, and we have said that we have a faith over here, now let's compare which faith is better and healthier for humanity. Let's talk about hope as we get ready to end for a moment here. And and we have lots, lots of reasons um, to demonstrate why Christianity is reasonable, but here's just the last one. The Christian understanding about our world 
is not pessimistic about humanity and negative about humanity. Atheism pretends that, that, that their view of humanity is so positive and optimistic about human potential, but, but that we are so negative about humanity. No, 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 you've missed it. Our worldview about people in our world is way more optimistic and positive. Theirs is, is, is filled with nothingness and, and, and forgottenness. Forgottenness, like somebody dies and there is no afterlife, you're just gone and forgotten. And your life meant nothing. Forgottenness. And, and also this, this is important, their view brings about the triumph of injustice. Injustice. Now, let, let me explain this, and, and we're getting ready to close in just a moment here. Are y'all still with me in it so far? We have a rational belief for the hope that is inside of every human being, and I'll show this to you. Let's say all of you here this morning represent humanity. If I were to ask you, how many of you have this, this belief inside of yourself that there are things broken in our world, but that you long for something better? You, you, you hope for something better. The, the, this idea of hope inside of you. My question, where do you think that hope comes from since every one of you have, here have different DNA, different parents, did different um, 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 upbringings, but all of you have hope? that something is wrong, but it can be made better. Here is the amazing thing. This hope that you have inside of you is not um, only something that Americans have or people in Marble Falls or First Baptist Marble Falls has. This idea of hope innately put on the heart of, some, of, of people is a universal fact of people all throughout our world, regardless of culture, regardless of age, and regardless of time. Um, it's not just you who feel that way. Where does this innate, um, um, culture transcending, time transcending, innate feeling of hope come from? Humans are endowed with this mysterious thing that, that says something's wrong, but it can be better. And C.S. Lewis said that this innate characteristic is a clue that it is evidence that because humans long for something better all across our globe, all across history, could that be an indication that they are made for something better? That there is something better in this that, that can happen in our world? Y'all, if, if this idea of hope were just a little one-off, if it were if it only existed in a small sample of one population or if hope were only tied to one culture of people, then we could dismiss it. Then this has no relevance. But it's the very fact and the very mystery that when you talk to anybody, and they may disagree with what that hope looks like, but all, all people say there is this innate hope that we have for something that is just and good in, in the world. And when we say, well, where did that come from? Atheism has no answer, but Christianity says, ah, what if you are a well-crafted instrument longing to be played, desiring that atheism doesn't know what to make of it, this longing for hope? And um, here is what one um, atheist, a popular atheist named, Christian, uh, named, named Richard Dawkins who wrote The God Delusion, also wrote a book called River Out of Eden, A Darwinian View of Life, and he said this, in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. See, this is the triumph of injustice that we see in it. The universe we observe had precisely the properties that we should expect if there is, at the bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Well, 
The atheist Dawkins represents popular atheism in saying that, that there are no clues, no clues, no rational clues that anything in our world points to anything better. But they're ignoring that every person who's lived has a desire for hope. Uh, the, if they're right, then why does all humanity bring from within them this desire for progress and something better, that there is justice out there to be found? Christians see that and examine it, and we take that seriously. And we say this, if the desire exists in all people that something is better, then our answer, rather than ignoring that, is to say, there is something better. The reason that we long for it is because God says, the reason you want a different world is because God says there is a different world for you called heaven and the kingdom of God. The world called these things that, that, that heaven comes into our world and makes a difference. That's what we're longing for. We have an exciting answer for why this desire is in all people. And, and, and humanity has tried to fill that void for, for wanting something better with all kinds of things. And so Jesus Christ speaks into this longing and he says, you know what, you've been wanting something better. You have a feeling that something should be better in life. And you want to know the way to it? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And our witness and testimony to the world is this. You're going to have faith in something. And our witness is when you have your faith in Jesus Christ, he gives you life and he gives you justice and he gives all of these things that make sense of our world. It's better. It's a better way to live. Atheism ends up in this place called nihilism. Nihilism. Everyone say nihilism. Nihilism, here is the definition for it. Nihilism is the view that nothing has any value. This is where atheism takes people. Atheism's view that there is no deep meaning and no purpose as to why we are all here. It ends up creating a nihilistic society that, 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 that there is nothing holding any of it up and eventually it will all cave in on itself and then the vacuum of that caving in that will leave will always be filled by a tyrannical, totalitarian, evil kind of person. I, I ask, how reasonable is that? How, how much better is that? How much hopeful? How hopeful is that? And so our conclusion then is this. When they say, prove to me that that there is a God empirically. And I say, well, no, I can't do that. And then they cast doubt and they say, well, then, then, then that means I'm doubting that you have any real belief. You're not certain about it in this kind of scientific, empirical way because you can't prove it. And so we laugh and we say, okay. Well, I suppose if, if you love the empirical method, why don't you prove through the same method that God doesn't exist? And then they can't. And we say, okay, well, then you have a faith claim that God doesn't exist. And I can cast just as much doubt on your claim as you can on mine. So now let's see which faith view is the best for our world and the most life-giving. And then we come to this conclusion that doubts do not crumble Christianity. Because we were never expecting to have empirical proof after all. That doesn't hurt us. No big deal. Here is our witness, that everyone's going to have faith in something that they cannot prove empirically. And our faith in the blessed story of Jesus Christ makes a difference in our world. And it has reasons that are rational and logical. It's rational to believe in God. Christianity makes sense of the world around us. The sin and the evil that we see in our world... Christianity looks at it and check, we have an answer for it. The, the goodness, the goodness we see in our world, check. The, the, the idea that humanity longs and hopes for something better in the world, check. 
My faith checks all of the boxes. And I wonder today if, if yours does. You've been watching the video sermon podcast of First Baptist Church of Marble Falls, Texas. Never miss an archived sermon or video posted to our YouTube channel by subscribing to it at youtube.com slash fbcmf2. For more information about our church and to hear an audio-only version of this sermon, please visit us online at fbcmf.org.